Welcome to On Dementia, Care, Community, and Creativity, a conversation with Dr. Susan H. McFadden. My name is Carrie Pollack, and I'm Director of Marketing and Communications for Aging Wisdom, and I'll be moderating today's conversation. This event is the second in a series of three conversations with leaders in elder care who have published books in 2020 that challenge our assumptions about dementia and provide a deeper understanding of how to support persons with dementia, their care partners, and their community. Presented by the Fry Art Museum, the University of Washington Memory and Brain Wellness Center, and Aging Wisdom, the series honors the 10-year anniversary of the Fry Art Museum's Creative Aging Programs, which is also being celebrated with an exhibition at the Fry, Art on the Mind. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Duwamish and Suquamish tribes, who have since time immemorial stewarded the lands and waters of this place we now call Seattle. Please join me in offering gratitude and respect to their elders, past and present, as well as future generations for their stewardship. Now a few housekeeping items before we get started. Today's event will last an hour. The first part will be a conversation with the author, interspersed with readings from her book, and we'll save the last 15 minutes for your questions. Note that you'll all be on mute during the webinar. So please use the chat function to type comments or questions to others along the way, or the Q&A function to offer a question you'd like the panelists to respond to at the end. The chat and Q&A buttons may be in a different place around the top or bottom of your screen, whether you're using a phone, computer, or tablet. Live captions are available. Simply choose the closed caption button and select whether you'd like to view them as a subtitle or a full transcript. Note that when this webinar, with this webinar format, only the panelists' faces are visible, so nobody else can see your image. We will be rec recording this event for future viewing. So let's take a moment to see how each of us may be connected to the topic of dementia. You'll see a multiple choice question pop up on your screen. Please select your response. If you choose other, you can provide more information in chat. I'll give it a couple more seconds. Thank you, everybody. So let me provide some context about the book we'll be exploring today, Dementia-Friendly Communities. Creating dementia-friendly communities can give people with dementia the chance to continue meaningful lives with reciprocal personal relationships. Underpinning successful dementia-friendly communities is an awareness of people with dementia as active citizens and the importance of supporting engagement in community life. Dementia-Friendly Communities offers an overview of the Dementia-Friendly Communities movement, showing the many benefits of this approach. It describes community initiatives from across the globe, such as Dementia Friends, Memory Cafes, Creative Engagement with the Arts, through organizations like Time Slips. This compassionate book tells another story about dementia, away from negative stereotypes. This alternative approach claims people can retain a sense of dignity, hold on to hope, sustain meaningful relationships, and live with a sense of purpose with support from their communities. Now it's my great pleasure to welcome to the virtual stage, Dr. Susan H. McFadden, an experienced teacher and researcher in the field of dementia. She was formerly professor of psychology at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh and co-founded the Fox Valley Memory Project, 
whose vision is to help create dementia-friendly communities. You can learn more about the Memory Project at foxvalleymemoryproject.org, and you'll find the link in the chat. In addition to authoring dementia-friendly communities, Susan co-authored with her husband, John McFadden, Aging Together, Dementia, Friendship, and Flourishing Communities. Susan, it's great to have you here all the way from my childhood stomping grounds, the Fox River Valley of Wisconsin. So thank you for joining us. And here I am. Ta-da! Thank you, Carrie. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm just delighted to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody who has organized this program. I've seen a number of names I recognize of dear friends who have popped up on the chat. So, and uh, uh, people I don't know, just thank you all for being here today. It's yes. great. <laughs> well, let's dive right in. So tell us the story about your book, which I have marked up and highlighted. <laughs> oh, I just love it. Why did you write a book about dementia-friendly communities? Well, uh, you mentioned Fox Valley Memory Project, mm -hmm. and I was a co-founder of that uh, 10 years ago. At that time, I didn't really know the term dementia-friendly community. So in 10 years, so much has happened. Uh, but somehow uh, we uh, got together with uh, several other people in the community to say, what do we need in this community, uh, particularly around issues of aging? And we identified immediately that we needed to pay attention to people living with some type of dementia. And so we set out to figure out how to do that. Uh, so um, somehow I talked to my husband, John, into going to England in the summer of 2011 and driving 860 miles on the other side of the road. Uh, and all we did was visit memory cafes because I had never been to a memory cafe. There were very few of them in the U.S. at that time, but England had a lot. And people were incredibly friendly and hospitable to us. Um, we saw no tourist attractions in England, but we saw a lot of church basements uh, and we learned a lot. And so we came back and I started looking at the literature out of England and I um, noticed some early publications that were filled with quotes from people living with dementia. And, and this organization had gone all around uh, big cities and small towns asking people with dementia what they wanted from their communities. And they said, we want to be able to go to the places we've always enjoyed going to, like the library and the post office and, the, and restaurants. But we want people to understand that we might be a little confused sometimes. And, and we want people to treat us with patience and not hostility. And um, th this was just, uh, just opened my mind so much to read these quotes from people living with dementia. Um, and so I started to learn more about that. And um, we launched Fox Valley Memory Project. And here we are 10 years later. Um, now there are lots of what people call toolkits mm -hmm. to develop dementia friendly communities. Um, and they have lots of very specific advice on how to do it. But I thought we needed to go deeper and broader on this question. Uh, and so that's what I wanted to do in the book. Um, and then the last kind of motivator for this was that we all hear all the time that there are about 6 million people living with Alzheimer's disease, usually is what's said, in the United States. And, you know, what does that number mean? Th those people are not all going to be able to live in memory care, right? Because it's so expensive and they, they just, what, they can't do that. And so our communities have to figure out a way to step up. And that's another motivation for writing this book. How do we do this? So, yeah. Well, that's, this will certainly, it, it, it's a great guidebook. 
<laughs> and it's for all communities. And I think it because it um, you draw from so many different examples internationally, um, everybody can kind of see themselves and the potential for their community no matter where they live, be it rural, urban, suburban. It's beautiful. I'm curious too, how you got interested in dementia? Um, well, <laughs> I've been teaching about aging. I like people have heard me say this. I've been teaching about aging since I was a brunette. Um, <laughs> back in, I, I started teaching about aging in the 1970s, the early 70s. And um, so I've always been interested in aging, but it was not until the 90s that I began to realize that in gerontology, we were separating people who had dementia from people who didn't. And, and so in gerontology, we were talking about successful aging and the well elderly. And, you know, it made it sound like people who had dementia had failed at aging somehow. Um, and, and I thought that was wrong, that we were splitting them off like that. And I was actually somebody who fell into that trap. Um, I had worked for about four years co-editing a big fat book on religion, spirituality, and aging. And I just took it off the shelf the other day. It was published in 1995. There were in the index, there are only five pages out of 600 that mention Alzheimer's or some type of dementia. I mean, it was terrible. We were blind to this. Um, so then we um, did a second edition of this handbook uh, that came out in 2003. And I made sure we had two chapters devoted to dementia, various issues related to dementia, and plus other discussion about dementia throughout the book. So, you know, I did that too. I, I was not paying en enough attention. Um, a couple of other um, things that happened were that I uh, was able to go to, I think the second meeting of the Pioneer Network. Oh, so sure. Yeah. 40 people who gathered in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Uh, and it was, it was absolutely transformative experience for me. And the third reason that I got interested in dementia was meeting Ann Basting um, in 1996, who you'll be talking to next month. So yeah, lots of things came together at the end of the 90s um, that put me on this pathway. Thank goodness. <laughs> Thank you for that. Well, the, the way that Dementia Friendly Communities, your book is... Um, laid out is just so smart. I just think it's very holistic. It's very inclusive. It, it's just very thoughtful. So thank you for that. And I just love the this approach to, you know, dementia friendly, dementia inclusive communities. And I also really appreciate how you disrupt old assumptions. <laughs> Um, and I have to confess, it's been a learning curve for me through the years too. I've been working in the field for over 25 years and it's it's been eye-opening. I mean, no excuses. But right off the bat in part one of your book, you make a strong case for the need to reframe the narrative around dementia and social change. I mean, words matter. I'd love to have you talk about that. Oh, yes. Words matter. Language is so important. And um, I think we often don't realize the kind of language we fall into using uh, when we're talking about dementia. But once I start to identify some of these things, I think you'll all start noticing this. Um, uh, but to back up a little bit and to remind us that um, we've had changes in language in the way that we talk about people with uh, developmental and intellectual disabilities. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's been an enormous change. And an attitudinal change comes with that when we change the way we speak about these folks. Um, uh, we've changed the way we think about people in wheelchairs, right? Um, and, and many of us on this call can remember the fight against the Americans with Disability Act yep. until we figured out that those accommodations were helping everybody. Uh, so that 
um, these changes in language and in attitudes then can also influence changes in public policy. And so all of this gets put together. Um, the difference, however, when we're talking about dementia is that none of us are ever going to have Down syndrome, right? And we hope we're not going to have to spend time in a wheelchair or whatever, but, but we're all aging. And so dementia is a possibility for every one of us. And that makes it different. And, and so that adds to the fear uh, that is out there in the culture that we're trying to address with these programs. Uh, and I think, it's, I think it's really important to recognize that because that then gets associated with aging. Uh, and you know we've got all kinds of negative attitudes about aging also. Um, so we don't want these dehumanizing attitudes to be associated with people having dementia. Um, and we want to identify and eliminate the barriers that are preventing them from living as well as possible. Mm -hmm. And we can do that in our communities. Yes. We can do it through words. So I'd love to have you share um, some excerpts from Dementia Friendly Communities. I'd love to have you read from the section, the story shifts from senility and brain disease to personhood and citizenship. Okay. Uh, so I got this idea of this kind of timeline uh, starting at the kind of the end of the 19th century on through the 20th century into the 21st century. I got this from uh, two authors, Ruth Bartlett and Deborah O'Connor, um, I'll mention them later, who kind of laid this out. Um, so I'll just start reading uh, this section. Dr. Alzheimer died in 1915. So he could not have known how pre-senile dementia that he identified in Auguste D would be described at the end of the 20th century as a worldwide epidemic bearing his name. Now I wanna pause for a minute and say, you know, we've all been through a year of pandemic. But for the last few years, I have heard too many people talk about the epidemic of Alzheimer's disease. And that is a terrible term. You were talking mm -hmm. about words before. It's a terrible term to apply to somebody who has a type of dementia. Because now, as we all know, uh, in, in a, in, when we talk about epidemics or pandemics, they're contagious, right? Yes. Dementia is not contagious. Not contagious. And, and, and you don't treat dementia with social isolation because that makes it worse. Yes. And yet we've used that language of epidemic to refer to Alzheimer's and dementia. So anyway, that's my little soapbox thing. I'll move on. <laughs> because when I wrote this book, I didn't know anything about a pandemic that was coming. Nor did we. <laughs> Nobody did. So anyway, back to Dr. Alzheimer. Dr. Alzheimer also could not have known that his name would be affixed to a disease movement with social and political forces shaping it. In other words, this is not merely a story about brains having the amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles he identified. It is a story about human beings contending with beliefs about their condition that define them as having a frightening brain disease for which money must be raised to find a cure. Now, an important shift happened in the 20th century. We went from thinking, well, you get old and you get senile to the identification of Alzheimer's disease. So we biomedicalized it and mm -hmm. we, you know, we had people living in um, places that were like hospitals, right? Um, and so the whole thing was dealt with on a medical level. Um, however, an important shift happened at the end of the 20th century. In 1997, Tom Kitwood published a book, little tiny book, called Dementia Reconsidered, The Person Comes First. 
he critiqued the biomedical model of dementia that had prioritized diseased brains. He called for a new way of thinking about people living with dementia that emphasized personhood. And he defined personhood in terms of social relationships that we engage with. So it was about relationships. So the experience of dementia is not merely shaped by what happens in an individual's brain. The neurological changes are certainly important, but they need to be viewed within the context of a complex dynamic interaction of the person's personality, life history, physical health, and social connections. Mm -hmm. So, so that was Kitwood who was calling forth this idea of personhood. Um, and then, as I said, Ruth um, uh, Bartlett and Deborah O'Connor came along and they then said, well, it's fine to talk about personhood, but we need to talk about social citizenship. We need to talk about the fact that these folks having dementia live in our communities and they can still contribute to our com communities. Um, they can still be an important part of our communities. Um, and so they call that the fourth movement in this historical progression. Um, and, and, and associated with their work has been the work of a Canadian social scientist named Pia Contos, who some of you know, uh, and I love her work. And she writes about people who are living with um, uh, advanced dementia. And she talks about um, relationships that are communicated through what she calls embodied selfhood. In other words, we communicate our relationships through our bodies and through our, the way we move and, mm -hmm. and our facial expressions. So I just have one more paragraph I wanna read you. This one's very special to me because I knew this person. And um, by the way, any of these names I use are not anybody's real names, but okay. So consider this example. Sue has lived in a memory care community for several years as her dementia symptoms have become more severe. She can no longer control her body and balance enough to walk safely. So she uses a wheelchair that must be pushed by others. Staff who tend to her needs, including basic functions like eating, dressing, and using the bathroom, know her well. She rarely speaks and has trouble coordinating movement of her head. Nevertheless, anyone carefully observing her interactions between Sue and staff can see that they share meaningful relationships. When brought to an activity, Sue raises her head just enough to look at the person who has transported her and flashes a brief smile. She lifts her right hand slightly in a wave of acknowledgement. When someone kneels by her wheelchair and grasps her hand, she squeezes them. In other words, Sue is, is engaging with others. She is being relational through her body. And I do not want to leave people like Sue out of this discussion of dementia-friendly communities. Yep. And all too often that happens because these care communities where folks like Sue live are a part of our community. Very true. And the challenge for us, if we're thinking about dementia-friendly communities is to figure out ways to include them. And um, you have a great, this gives me a great segue to talk about your program next month with Ann Basting, because she's going to be talking about how the arts can provide that bridge between these care communities and folks with advanced dementia and the communities outside the walls. Yes. And I just, I think that is so important. And, you know, I was interacting with Sue in her wheelchair by doing time slips. Oh. So, yeah, it was, yeah, wonderful. We love time slips. If yeah. folks don't know about time slips, is it timeslips.org? Is that yes. where you can go yeah, learn yeah, more yeah. about time yeah. slips? Yeah. Please, I encourage everybody here, if you're not familiar with the program, please. And then you'll learn more about it next month with, right. with Anne. Thank you for sharing all that. That just 
beautiful that flow and 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 thank you for reminding us um, I see that a lot in our practice too, is just that slowing down, being observational, being in the moment. Um, we just don't do that typically as a society, but there's just, that's where the magic happens. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about being relational. And you know, that social model of dementia and just the social relational citizenship you know, this seems to be a foundation and a, an essence of your, of your book and of being a truly dementia-friendly and inclusive community. So would you talk a little bit about that, please? Sure. Um, so um, as I say, um, we can start with our language and, and think about the attitudes that we all have. Like I told you, I edited that big fat book with five pages that talked about dementia. I mean, it's terrible. Um, so we really need to be a little self-critical about this too. Um, and um, here's an example um, of uh, something that I encounter all the time in terms of how people living with dementia are referred to. Um, and this example comes from a document, and I think you're gonna put this in the uh, chat, the connection. Um, it came from the uh, Dimension Action Alliance, mm -hmm. and um, it's uh, called uh, Living Fully with Dementia, Words Matter. Yep. It refuted what we all learned as children that although sticks and stones can harm us, names cannot, but they can. Yep. They can shape how people with dementia are treated, consequently affecting how they think and feel about themselves. So this is an example from this document uh, from a man named Michael Ellenbogen who was diagnosed at age 49, but he started to have symptoms at age 39. And this is what he said. He said, I do not like the term patient unless I am in a hospital or medical setting. If I hear this word used to refer to me in other settings, it weakens me. And I worry I will start acting like a patient and need someone to do even more for me. Now, think of all the times in newspapers and magazines and, you know, at, People talk about dementia patients and they're not in a doctor's office. Exactly. Right. Aww. And here's Michael Ellen Bogan saying, this hurts me. This limits me. This, um, uh, this excludes me. Yeah. So, um, so it, it's a way to think about how we are um, interacting in community. Yes. Thank you for that. And I believe that, um, Caroline is going to put that in the chat, the link to um, the Living Fully with Dementia Words Matter from the Dementia Action Alliance, which you just read from. So thank you so much for that. And, and including Michael's quote, that's really powerful. Now in chapter five, which is Dementia Advocacy and Activism, which Michael, you know, Michael's quote is a perfect example of that. I love it. You encourage those who are diagnosed and their care partners to speak up for themselves. So may we explore uh, that section, human rights and dementia? Yeah. And uh, I'd love you to read from a section of that. And let's just learn about why hearing from the person living with dementia is so essential. Right. I, I just, I thought that was so important um, because, you know, as I told you at the beginning of this interview, that reading those quotes from those people in England really got me going on this. I, I one quote in particular, I remember um, that uh, meant a lot to me because libraries are my happy places. Sure. And, and this was a quote from somebody who said, I don't want to go to the library anymore because they've got this self checkout system and I'm worried that I'm not going to do it right. And I don't know who I should ask. And, you know, the library should be available to everybody. Right. Yeah. So we need to be listening to people who have dementia about what they need from their communities. So anyway, here's a quote from that chapter. 
The social model of dementia is gaining traction around the world as more people with the diagnosis and their care partners speak up for themselves. The social model considers the effects of the physical and psychosocial environment on how persons living with dementia experience their worlds. It does not deny that identifiable changes occur in the brains of people with dementia symptoms. Activists like those I describe in the chapter I'm reading from, they all acknowledge the difficulties they endure because of these brain changes. However, instead of focusing solely on the person whose brain is changing, the social model views persons having dementia within the context of their relationships with others and the places they live, work, love, and play. It affirms their dignity and the need to honor and protect their human rights. Um, and, and so this discussion about human rights is something that is um, pretty new being brought into the discussion about dementia. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's important. Here's another little part that I read uh, that I wrote at the end of that um, section. No one should think that affirming human rights sugarcoats the experience of having dementia or caring for someone who has a dementia. Nor should anyone think that striving to create dementia-friendly communities is a simple matter of getting some interested people together to start a memory cafe. This work is hard. Yep. People who do not wanna pay for needed programs and services will resist these efforts. Public policy changes take time and often result in compromises that disappointing to activists and advocates. Political leadership favoring dementia-friendly policies can be replaced with leadership having very different priorities. Nevertheless, despite challenges like this, people all over the world are working to promote quality of life, change the culture that excludes and stigmatizes people with dementia, and offer an array of options to support the social citizenship and human rights of people living with this progressive condition. <laughs> Thank you. Ooh, I, I just got to tell folks this, Susan, your book, and, and I've said this too many times, it is just so rich with information and, um, and it's just so honest. That's the other thing I love about your book. Uh, it gets real. It gets real. Susan, also as a uh, professor and a researcher, and, and me as a researcher, I love just having access to information. And so every chapter has is just filled with endnotes. I mean, this is just, this is the most incredible guidebook. Okay, a fangirl. Okay, fangirl here. Let's see. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, why well, should let's just talk real quickly though about why it why is it essential to listen to the person who is living with dementia? Why is it important for them to guide these conversations to, you know, for why is it essential for them their voice to be heard? Well, I'll go to the title of the book, Dementia Friendly Communities. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm terrible at writing titles because you know I'm so academic. They're all my titles are always so boring, uh, but. Um, it, it should have had a longer title because it should have been dementia friendly and inclusive communities. Because I think it's possible to be friendly in a kind of paternalistic way, oh, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. I'll be friendly with you, but I don't really need your friendship with me, right? Yep. Or uh, I'll do nice things for you, but I don't need to really listen to you. And so that term inclusive is so important. And um, and, 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 and we need to listen to what they have to say about what they want from their communities. Uh, and, and often what they say they want from their communities is what everybody wants mm -hmm. from their community. And that, and that then takes the barriers away. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you for emphasizing that. Will you dedicate an entire part one of five 
of your book to friendship and community inclusion. And I'd like to talk about the role and the importance of friendships. Words matter, friends matter. So if you'll, I think we have a, a, oh yes, there's a section of the book that you want to tell the story of some friends. Right. I think they've known one another since junior high, correct? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I wanted to have this chapter on friendship. John and I had written that book about friendship a couple mm-hmm. of years ago um, because at least in the psychology literature on dementia, um, most of the emphasis on relationships is on families. Yeah. And, and of course that's very important, mm-hmm. but we tend to think about, you know, being care partners only in terms of family relationships. And and that's wrong (laughs) because then we isolate these families. I think that memory cafes in particular offer a fabulous opportunity for friends to continue in friendship, to remain in friendship. So here's a story about that. Again, not using their real names. Grace, Susie and Grace have been friends since junior high. Now they are in their mid fifties and have come to their first memory cafe. As they enter a room full of people sitting around tables in a library meeting room, they laughingly describe how their friendship goes back to the time of young teen hijinks. Susie is learning to live with younger onset Alzheimer's disease, and Grace has promised to accompany her through the strange land of dementia. That term strange land comes from a wonderful book by an Anglican priest named Malcolm Goldsmith. Um, I love that term. Anyway, they do not know what to expect at a memory cafe, but have heard that it is a time set aside for enjoying camaraderie, coffee, sweet treats, and some kind of engaging program without the stigma usually attached to a dementia diagnosis. As I greet them and write out their name tags, I think about how unusual it is for friends to enjoy memory cafes together. Most of the time, memory cafe participants attend with their spouses, partners, adult children, or siblings. It is rare for friends to come to memory cafes. However, memory cafes offer a marvelous opportunity for friends to share enjoyable experiences while giving family care partners respite for a couple hours. The memory cafe regulars greet Susie and Grace warmly. And a few minutes after everyone gathers, we sing our welcoming song, naming each person in the room. Everyone smiles and waves to the group as their names are sung. I can see that Susie and Grace appear to be comfortably settled into this new experience. Although Susie and Grace have known each other for decades, a number of other friendships in the room are relatively new formed among people who regularly attend memory cafes. Some also participate in day-long bus trips, well, before the pandemic, (laughs) which include lunch and visits to local attractions. They gather at uh, informal meetups at family restaurants. They sing together in our chorus. None of these activities are unusual for friends to enjoy together, but these are people living with a condition often associated with social isolation and loneliness, both for the diagnosed person and the care partner. So, you know, the, and, and, and the issue here is how Susie and Grace will continue to be in friendship through this journey of dementia. Um, and Grace might need some training in what she'll do when Susie no longer has as much language or when Susie no longer really remembers the story of junior high, right? Mm -hmm. But they can still remain in friendship. Uh, And and I just think that is so essential. Um, I want to read one more section from this chapter. It's just a paragraph uh, that strikes home to me personally. I'll tell you why in a minute. So this is about old friends very old friends. I recently chatted with an older woman at a community fundraising event. When I told her about writing this book, she got a pained expression on her face 
and described a longtime friend who may have some type of dementia. This woman said her friend asks her a question and then repeats the question 10 minutes later. I sympathized with her distress over the change in her friend and said she might gently suggest that her friend talk with her doctor about her memory concerns. I also said that if the friend eventually does receive a dementia diagnosis, then it will be critically important for her to promise to accompany her friend regardless of where the dementia journey takes her. The woman looked troubled by what I said, so I didn't press to say more. Given the social setting where this conversation took place, I did not have the opportunity to pursue the conversation. If I had, I would have talked about how people can learn new and meaningful ways to remain close to their friends living with dementia. And the reason why this strikes home to me in a painful way is that I saw this happen to my mother. Um, I, I saw her interacting with people she had known for 30 years. She was trying to be social and friendly and she would ask them the same question and they moved away from her and they complained or they would say, oh, Joan, you just asked us that. And, and I could see how, how shamed she was, mm -hmm. right? She felt shame. Um, she was hurt by that. And those friends didn't know how to interact with her now that she was forgetting things. But they could have learned. Mm -hmm. And we can all learn. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's my story. <laughs> Thank you for that encouragement. So true. We're going to wrap up a little here, coming to our, our last question. And I just want to remind people we're going to have time for Q&A at the end. So please, as you're listening to us, if there's any burning question you have, we're going to do our best to get to you. So I love that in your book, you do present a very fact-based rather than fear-based perspective and a very honest one. Um, and on page 139, you say reimagining community in light of increasing numbers of person ha persons having dementia will require changes in attitudes, language, policies, and practices. And the last paragraph of Dementia Friendly Communities encourages the reader with these words. Someday, even without cures for all the types of dementia, the practice and policies of dementia friendliness and dementia inclusivity may be intimately woven into the whole life of our communities. The ideal would be to embrace ways of living together in community that are friendly toward and inclusive of all persons. Making communities good for people living with dementia can make them good for everyone. So I think those are just such important words to close on, on so many different levels. So in closing, and before we go to the Q&A, do you have a, just a, a thought or an encouragement for us to perhaps strengthen, you know, existing dementia-friendly, dementia-inclusive communities? Or um, I'm sure there are plenty of people joining us today who are here because they see a need for it in their community. What, what's your encouragement for them? other than buying your book. So I, I'm sorry, I got to push it. I got to hawk it, got to buy Thank the book. You. You. <laughs> um, you know, I think we need to start with the difficult work of acknowledging our own vulnerabilities, our own fears about dementia. We need to critically examine our own assumptions, our own language, our own attitudes, not just about dementia, but about aging, aging in general. Yeah. And we need to talk with people living with dementia and we need to be certain that they are included from the beginning in our discussions about making our communities more welcoming and hospitable and supportive to them and their care partners. We, we don't wanna just come in as you know people who know it all and say, oh, here's what we need, ta-da. Uh, no, we need to listen. Um, we need to know what they want from their communities and also to get back to a point I made earlier. As we drive past, which I'm sure most of us do every day, all those care communities that are popping up in our neighborhoods, 
We need to think about the human beings who live and work there. And, and we need to figure out ways to build bridges across what I sometimes call the invisible moats that surround mm -hmm. them. Yes. And, and think about how those buildings and those people inside those buildings are a part of our community. Very true. And, and, and so Fox Valley Memory Project, I'll just put in a last plug for Fox Valley Memory Project. We talk about how we are going to be with people from the time they are first worried about their memory and ability mm -hmm. to think and make decisions on through to the end. So if they have to relocate to memory care, we'll still be with them. And we have programs that connect to people in memory care. And one of the really important things that I have learned is that um, even after a loved one has died, the, the person remaining, the widow, the widower, they stay connected to us because they have become our friends, yes. right? Yes. And that is a beautiful thing that I only learned by doing this work. Yeah. So. I, I wish everybody well in doing it. It's a source of tremendous joy and meaning. Definitely. Yep. And strengthening community for everybody. So now we have had a chance to, thank you, Susan. I'm sorry. You're welcome. So now, now that we've had a chance um, to open it up for questions through the Q&A. And again, you can type your questions there. Um, our time is limited. We'll get to as many as we can. So let's see what we got here. Um, some have already been answered. Uh, this is interesting. Is there a better word than dementia, which doesn't convey the spectrum as in, you know, like the autism spectrum? Um, well, people are starting to talk about, um, uh, you know, Alzheimer diseases not just one Alzheimer's disease, but diseases. Um, the word dementia is uh, perhaps going to go away uh, in the next five years uh, to be replaced by neurocognitive disorder, okay. uh, according to the DSM-5. Yes. <laughs> um, and that it was interesting in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the fifth edition that came out, there's a big fight that went on about how to do the chapter on dementia. And what they said in it was that they were gonna keep the word dementia because older people were used to using that word, but with younger people now being diagnosed with some type of dementia, they didn't like that word so much. And so mm -hmm. they were gonna perhaps more uh, comfortably embrace neurocognitive disorders as a plural. Um, and so I'm, I'm not quite sure where we're going to go with that. Um, mm -hmm. I had people tell me that you should never put the word dementia in the title of a book because it'll scare people away. Oh. Um, so, which is exactly what I'm talking about. Yes. <laughs> uh, but um, so I, I'm not quite sure where we're going, but I am starting to hear uh, certainly people are talking about, and I did this in the book, the dementias, you know, to, to, make it plural to say, it's not just about Alzheimer's disease. It's about frontotemporal. It's about mm -hmm. Lewy body. It's about vascular. It's about all these different types of dementia. Um, so I think we are getting there. I don't think we're there yet. Okay. Thank you. So what are some of the ways to maintain friendships as capacity changes? Well, um, Obviously, it's going to be individual, um, but I love the idea of friends accompanying friends to memory cafes. Memory cafes are just such wonderful experiences, uh, and um, I think friends would find out it's a lot of fun. Um, to uh, do like my husband is doing with a good friend of his with vascular dementia, making sure that they get together for lunch yes. once a month. Um, and it's okay if they talk about the same things every time. It's, it's not about the content of the conversation yes. so much as being together, right? Um, 
Uh, there's a lot of information on the time slip sl site that you'll hear about next time um, for friends and family. Yeah. Um, and just, you know, how to sit with a person and, and maybe they don't have a lot of language, but you can listen to bird calls together, right? And, and, and you can look at flowers together and, and, and you can create a poem. Um, so we need to kind of think outside of our ordinary ways of talking to our friends yeah. and get creative about it. Yeah. Well, here's a nice question to compliment that. Somebody asks, can I ask why friends are less likely to be seen at memory cafes? I think it is because in in our culture, and maybe it's different in other countries, but in our culture, we have decided, and I don't think consciously, but we've just kind of made this decision that it's the family's responsibility. It's just up to the family. And that friends, friends are supposed to have fun together, right? Friends are supposed to just enjoy being well you know it's not always enjoyable being with a person having dementia mm -hmm. right there are hard days there are times when you might walk in and your friend says your friend with dementia says i don't want to talk to you today well that's not a reason for breaking off the friendship mm -hmm. but we need to learn how to live into that new reality of the friendship um, so yeah, it is. And you talk about those, the different types of friendships, right. Yeah. Um, had never really thought about that way, but you're a social scientist. So it makes perfect sense. <laughs> I'm like, oh, of course. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, let's see. Somebody asks. What? Oh, where are there dementia successful communities in the United States? best practices in the communities. Well, I'm going to just put a little shout out for Seattle area. Um, I'm just really proud in particular for, of my friend, Mary Grace Becker, who really spearheaded that and just assembled people, like-minded people, kindred spirits. And so if you want to learn more, I just encourage you go to momentaseattle.org. And of course, the Fox River Valley in Wisconsin, so foxvalleymemoryproject.org. What are some other examples, Susan? Well, um, an easy uh, thing to do is to go to Dementia Friendly America, their website. Um, now, Dementia Friendly America, um, I had the great privilege of um, uh, being present for the launch of the precursor uh, to Dementia Friendly America, which started in Minnesota. Uh, and, and I'll never forget that I was at this big meeting of um, the Alzheimer's Association of Minnesota and North Dakota. And the people who had this organization called Act on Alts, ALZ, Act on Alzheimer's, they had figured out a way to um, help communities in Minnesota from large cities to small towns um, be dementia friendly. And, and they were one of the ones that put out an early toolkit on things that communities could examine, like, you know, um, how about your crosswalks? Can people get across the street, you know, before the light turns red? Um, uh, are your restaurants places that um, servers have been trained to react um, healthfully with people having dementia? How about your banks and your dentists and your veterinary offices and, and all these um, businesses in the community? Um, uh, and so Dementia Friendly America then um, has a map and it'll show you where dementia friendly communities have been um, uh, organized according to their particular outline of what a dementia friendly community looks like. So that's a place to start too. That's excellent. Well, I think we have time for one more question. And this is this is wonderful. The, the great question here is the assisted living facility my aunt has just entered seems pretty amazing in terms of being a community, but my aunt has always preferred to be alone with her cat. <laughs> Should we be pushing her to join the activities? I know that that's a very common question for families. I know. And friends. I of course. And um, it's very, um, uh, it, it strikes home to me also. Um, 
and it reminds me of a poem that I included in that big book that only had six pages on people having dementia. Um, but this poem was um, something, it was directed to the activities director and it says, you know, dear activities director, please, I don't really want to come join the activity. I just want to sit here today and remember picking berries with my husband, you know? So some of us need more time by ourselves and 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 so we need to recognize when that is supporting their mental health mm -hmm. and when the isolation the withdrawal from activities and from other people might be indicating depression oh, because yes. depression can be treated and it should be treated yeah. um so it's really about the person about the individual and we need to pay attention to that in honor and respect that. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry we weren't able to cover everyone's questions. There are so many other good ones. So we can maybe do that offline, possibly. Thank you, everybody. Much appreciated. Well, I just want to thank you again, Susan. This conversation has just, as always, been very enriching. I thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, our presenters, the Fry Art Museum, the University of Washington Memory and Brain Wellness Center, and my employer, Aging Wisdom. And thank you to everybody for attending today. And in the chat, you'll see some more links where you can find information about the author and um, her books. And uh, actually a link, Elliott Bay Books, our local book seller. Um, we love to uh, support our independent books and our next and last On Dementia Conversation is happening next month. And it's taking place on May 13th at noon Pacific. And it's going to be a conversation with Ann Basting, author of Creative Care, A Revolutionary Approach to Dementia and Elder Care. And the registration link can be found in the chat for that or at the uh, Fry Art Museum uh, website. So directly after the event, we're going to email a survey to everyone, and we appreciate you taking a moment to fill it out. And everyone who does will be entered into a raffle today to win a free copy of <laughs> Susan's book. So I encourage you to respond to the survey. So thank you again, Susan. Thank you all for coming and for your questions and for your participation. And look forward to seeing everyone next month. And Ann Basting. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs>